Ernie Bowling, the Chief Optometric Editor of Optometry Times Magazine. And again, it's my pleasure to be sitting here and get to have a conversation with Dr. Kelly Nichols, the Dean of my alma mater and a dry researcher par excellence. So, Kelly, please tell us a little bit about the TPOS Deuce 2 report. Well, thank you for having me here today. It's my pleasure to speak with you about something that's uh, very near and dear to my heart, dry eye and the TFOS Dues 2 report. Um, at RVO, there was a presentation that summarized the two, year, um, two years of work that went into preparing a nearly 500-page document, which will be published in the Ocular Surface Journal um, this coming July. And we're really excited from the standpoint of the dry eye community to get this out in the literature. Now, when you talk to most people and say, well, what do you think of that? They say, 500 pages, oh my goodness, I'll never read 500 pages. 500 pages. And uh, I guess I just want to say that it is intended to be a reference. I mean, anything you'd want to know is really there, and it should provide guidance for future researchers, clinicians, uh, scientists who want to propel the field forward for the next 10 years. But there's also going to be the executive summary, which is what people like me look forward yeah. to. The executive summary is somewhere in the ballpark of 20 or so, maybe even less pages, and then there'll be, for people with a uh, very quick, I want to get a quick, quick little bit, a two-pager front back that kind of gives the main, main highlight. So there'll be a variety of different public or social media um, avenues to get this information, and I think the publication team the communication team of the TFOS Dues 2 report will be spending a lot of effort to make sure that it's out there in a variety of media settings so that it's accessible for everyone. The presentation was very interesting. Um, they, uh, we, we likened it to a two-minute trailer mm -hmm. for a blockbuster movie coming out in the next yeah. month or so, but it, it was very informative. Like tell it a lot of work and the, they talked about the difference in the pages and the difference in the references mm -hmm. and things like that. Mm -hmm. The big talk from the uh, seminar was the new definition mm -hmm. for dry. And if you would please kind of elaborate on that a little bit. Well, you know, crafting a definition is a very difficult thing to do. And I was involved with that committee, co-chair of that um, subcommittee. And, you know, it's a lion's share because you're wordsmithing, you know, words and trying to rely on the evidence that's there to craft a definition, but yet create something that doesn't need to be revisited every few years. And trying to highlight all the elements of the research and the science that have been put into um, the, the knowledge base of that's out there and been put out there in the last 10 years. But in the end, you come up with something that's a refined version of what you've had before, which isn't all bad, which means no, that you weren't wrong. You weren't wrong in the first bit as you no. move forward. And we had a number of iterations of the definition, all of which you know were, were very good, but then you just want to make sure you're trying to hit all the, the nuances that are there. So some of the key words that um, we wanted to include, essentially one of the main ones was a homeostasis of the tear film, some sort of reflection that this is a, a system in balance and it's a very complicated system and that if you make changes to that it, it throws, I mean I really felt like the homeostasis word encapsulated you know, what dry is in a nutshell and how you get there. You can get there a number of different ways and we wanted that to be uh, reflected in the definition as well so it could come from a number of different, um, as we call multifactorial um, things that can lead into the definition. So. We also wanted to recognize that there are pathophysiological elements that could then be in that sort of homeostatic mechanism. And those things, um, you know, that you see, we know that osmolarity and inflammation highly studied. We're still not clear exactly how they all play it, but we know that they do play in the system. So those words were important to many to be involved. But we wanted to leave the door open for the things that we're going to find out in the next 10 years that might be key mechanistic elements as well. And we do know that sort of the neuropathic pain elements and sensory aspects are growing in terms of our knowledge base, and I think we'll continue to see more about that. Um, some of that might be a reason why we can't fully treat all dry patients, uh, because the sort of you know, pain sensations they may have may not be manageable, or maybe manageable in a different way, perhaps systemically. Notice in the definition said they have including with symptoms, and a lot of patients you see will come in and they have no symptoms, but they have some really nice dry eyes. Mm -hmm. There seem to be a little paradox there. Can you address that for me? I think that paradox has always been there in terms of the mm -hmm. signs and symptoms not correlating with one another. Right. And you know, early on research of mine has been in that area. And I still think people wrestle with that. Why, you know, why do some patients not say anything and yet you see things? And then if you do further inquire, you can tease it out. So some of it is, um, language, some of it is what a patient's willing to tell you if they're in for a different kind of office visit. 
for just a routine eye exam, they may be less likely to bring up that they have dry symptoms or they think that dry is just part of their life, part of getting old. And so for a variety of reasons, there may be no obvious um, symptoms that they're talking about, but if you inquire or become very um, uh, consistent with asking similar questions to every patient, you will get something out of patients. On the other hand of that, there are the patients that have had such bad dry eye that their you know, surfaces become numb, essentially, and you don't. You don't get as much out of that. Yes, they're normal. They don't, it's, it's been it's such a slow change over time. It's, it's just they're normal. But have you ever had a patient like that when you start to treat them, they realize they didn't feel their eyes were so bad until they start to get better? Yeah, and then they get better, better and then they're, hey, I'm starting to feel things. They're starting to bother me. Yeah, yeah maybe worse. Yeah, yeah, you're making it a little worse, so it's just one of the things that happens. We look forward to seeing it in publication in the next little bit and appreciate you taking the lead of this. Um, thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you. It's been my pleasure as an optometrist to be part of this. There you so go. Thank, thank you very, very much. much.